Welcome everyone to Earth Chapters, hosted by Pollinator Friendly Alliance. You can find us at pollinatorfriendly.org. Pollinator Friendly Alliance is a grassroots nonprofit powered by the enthusiasm of our partners and volunteers to protect the natural world, pollinators, and their habitats. Remember, everything in the natural world is connected. An ecosystem is a community of living things that work together and rely upon the other. Let's be good stewards of the ecosystem. Earth Chapter 5 is Buckthorn Removal and Woodland Understory Diversity with Bree Bowerly and How to Help Injured Spring Wildlife with Tammy Vogel. So let's get started. Okay. Um, I am Bree. Thanks, Lori, for having us here today and happy Earth Week, everybody. Um, I'm going to go really quick here. This is a huge topic. I could talk for um, an hour or two and I have about 20 minutes. So I'm going to try to fit all of this in. So um, my email address will be at the end. If you have specific questions, um, feel free to reach out via email. Um, but there will be a few minutes for questions in the chat, too. Um, this is pretty comprehensive. And I want to try to get to the end here where I talk um, a bit more about like introducing some good biodiversity into your woodland. So I'm going to breeze through some topics here. Um, in Minnesota, we really have um, two of the highly invasive buckthorn species and the most common would be the common buckthorn. Um, and that's going to be the um, major woodland invader and, and glossy buckthorn is um, a woodland invader as well, moves into a little bit wetter habitats or like woodland edge. Uh, woodland wetland edges and things like that and it's a little less common um, in Minnesota still. Um, the common buckthorn, um, egg-shaped leaves and blackberries and then the uh, plant gets its name really from the uh, terminal bud which looks like a deer hoof with the two buds and then a single thorn coming from the end of that. Um, and when you spend a lot of time working with buckthorn, it becomes pretty easily identifiable, but it can take a little bit of time to, to get there. But um, if you don't know it, you will learn it soon, I'm sure. Um, glossy buckthorn can be a little bit um, more easily mistaken with some of our native species. The berries um, go from like red to, to dark purple or almost black and a little bit different arrangement um, can kind of disguise itself as several different native species, including members of the cherry family. Uh, it's really easy to identify buckthorn in the fall time, especially common buckthorn. Um, say October or so, you get um, a lot of leaf loss from the native species, and there's a good um, period of time where uh, the uh, buckthorn is very green still. So it's a great time to identify your level of infestation. Invasion can take uh, many different forms depending on how long it's been in your woodland. Um, from seedlings to whips that are you know, three feet tall all the way up to six feet tall or so. And um, depending on the level of infestation you have um, can really dictate what uh, methods you might consider for removal um, up to these multi-stem, very old uh, buckthorn plants. So it's really important to make a plan. Um, it doesn't do you a ton of good to just cut buckthorn out of your woods and and assume that you're done because you're not. Um, so make a plan, know that you have a problem, identify your problem. Um, how are you gonna remove it? What are you gonna do with the woody debris? How are you gonna prevent more buckthorn and what are you going to replant? There's uh, mechanical options for removing buckthorn. Um, all, I'm gonna go through some different options here and, and some of the pros and cons of each. And again, move pretty quickly, but um, hand pulling or using a weed wrench um, is chemical free which is great and you know that the plant is dead if you're pulling the roots out um, but it can it can contribute to a lot of soil disturbance and cause erosion especially if you're working on slopes um, and it can up, uproot some native um, desirable species as well so um, it's really advisable on just the smallest um, of plants and if you have a really small infestation um, cutting with a chainsaw, a brush cutter, a loppers, um, or hand cutting. Those uh, can el eliminate larger trees, um, especially on a smaller infestation scale. So you're working quickly throughout your backyard woodland. Um, 
you need to do something with the reef breadth at that point, and it can leave a lot of material, a lot of you know, 12 foot tall or so um, stems that you have laying around then. Um, this is a brush cutter. It's really just a large weed whip, two handles, and you can um, put a saw blade on the end of it. It's a really handy tool to have, especially if you're maintaining uh, prairies or again, um, like a buckthorn woodland. It's a, it's a, it can be a really good investment. Um, but you're left with a stem, um, and these will almost always uh, create this crown of re sprouts um, to deal with, you know, through subsequent growing seasons. Another mechanical option on a larger scale, or um, or on a small scale, uh, depending on if you have a really heavy infestation, um, can be forestry mowing or using a brush hog or a DR mower, and those can be rented at you know general rental type um, stores, and um, they can do some really quick work on clearing heavy buckthorn infestations. Um, they shred the stumps so you don't get quite the same amount of re-sprouts or sometimes you get less re-sprouts or, or you just, they don't uh, create that cr same crown or hydra type appearance to the re-sprouts. Um, and it allows you better access to work um, back through the, uh, the project area. Um, and it gives you a little bit better um, prepared soil bed for um, potential replanting or reseeding. Uh, it is definitely a first step. Um, you're not done once you do this, uh, like the mowing type removal option. There's still going to be follow up work, um, either continual mowing, um, grazing, uh, et cetera. Um, so then that continued mowing can take different forms, you know, depending on your level of infestation um, and how often you're working in the woodlands, you can again keep going over those re-sprouts with a brush hog or a DR mower or a brush cutter or a lawn mower, um, just really depending on how many re-sprouts you're seeing there um, later in the growing season or in subsequent growing seasons. Um, depending on uh, how much energy is stored in those roots, uh, it's gonna be a bit of a battle, whether it's one year, two years or more um, with, uh, taking care of the re-sprouts. Uh, and at the same time, if you had mature uh, plants in your woodland, um, you'll have berries in, in, uh, in your seed bank and those will grow up in the soil and um, produce new stems. So it's really important to stay on top of that infestation as you go along. Um, another option could be burning stumps with a weed torch. This can damage the cork cambium layer and uh, take care of um, some potential re-sprouts. Uh, you can also use the um, buckthorn baggie and tin can method that I recommend Googling uh, if you're interested in knowing more about those. As I mentioned, goats can be a really great resource for taking care of re-sprouts. Um, they are not able to tackle that in initial infestation. You're really looking at buckthorn plants that are smaller than six feet. So whether you go in and cut uh, with a brush cutter, chainsaw, or do some uh, heavier duty mowing um, methods for initial removal, then you can bring the goats in later that growing season um, or subsequent growing seasons. And, and it almost always needs to be repeated, whether it's later in the same growing season um, or multiple uh, years of uh, visits with the goats. Um, there's a few different methods for, for putting goats on properties and either you can put a really uh, dense uh, number of goats in at one time into a small woodland. So in this case, uh, these goats are still being unloaded from a trailer and they're already gone to work. This is a high number of goats in a small piece of property and just in a couple of days, um, understory is cleared. Um, and then the other method would be just fewer goats for a longer period of time. We're really just looking to stress uh, those woody plants um, by herbivory. And at the same time, you're providing an ecosystem service of disturbance and um, turning up that uh, soil bank and providing bare soil for future uh, seeding and replanting. So goats are an amazing resource, um, uh, introducing grazing back into the woodland, uh, but they are not a one-stop shop and a lot of people you know, they hear about them and they get really excited, um, but there needs to be that initial removal prior to introducing uh, these herbivores. They are not able to, to take down mature trees. So just remember that, but they are an awesome option and so fun to use and, and really exciting to see those services expanding um, through the Metro 
and outstate areas here in Minnesota. Um, if you're going to cut the larger material, uh, then you have to consider what you're going to do with the do with it when when it's laying on the ground. So you can uh, chip it and haul it away. Uh, you can chip it and leave it back in the woods. Um, you can bring it to a brush drop, um, and you can leave it where it lays. So slashing um, is cutting up the woody material in you know say three foot lengths or so and leaving it lay. Um, this can be really great for stabilizing slopes or, and not um, doing dragging away. From those areas, you create some habitat, and again, it really depends on your level of infestation. Um, it makes it a little bit trickier to get back and work in these areas. Um, but if your plan is to leave it lay for you know a couple of growing seasons, then that can be um, good to leave lay. Um, burning, so making brush piles uh, to burn now or the next season, or to even leave in place as habitat. Uh, so when working in a heavily infest, infested woodland, you can uh, get a pile going and just keep adding to it. And that's really great um, when you're cutting in the winter time. Um, and really that is a recommendation to, to cut buckthorn um, kind of like August through March or so. You're really not looking to do the removal work in the springtime when the uh, sap is flowing upward. But after the um, energy is all put out into the leaves for the for the growing season. So really later summer and through the winter. And working over the winter time is great too for um, eliminating soil disturbance. So working over frozen ground conditions, especially when you're bringing in uh, heavy equipment or tract equipment. Um, so here's those brush piles. So you can either do a small fire pit style, um, especially uh, if you live somewhere where there's uh, ordinances. Um, so working within that three foot fire ring. And again, uh, just mentioning right now, um, springtime, not a great time for uh, cutting back there and also not a good time for burning piles. So hold off for a while. Um, also, the uh, here's a picture of a, a brush pile that would be left really for several growing seasons and makes great habitat. Um, so doing nothing. So uh, this is, we're getting into restoration options. So what to do after um, you've done the initial buckthorn removal. Um, so if you're lucky, there's native seeds in your soil bank and you end up with um, a very beautiful, diverse woodland by the time that you're done cutting and removing buckthorn uh, year after year and you see flushes of native species. Um, but more likely you're going to need to give it some encouragement. So overseeding with native grasses, sedges, and wildflowers. Um, there is there's uh, research being done right now that uh, it can compete with young buckthorn seedlings, uh, reduce future seed germination. So um, the U of M is uh, currently working on their Cover It Up citizen science program uh, where uh, citizens are uh, removing buckthorn in plots and uh, doing various seeding uh, and uh, monitoring what grows. So that study will be continuing on through 2022, but I encourage you to um, look it up. Uh, again, it's called Cover It Up, and that's um, by the U of M. So that's uh, some trials of different seed mixtures and, and what that can look like uh, as the um, growing seasons go move on after initial removal. Um, but adding any type of seed uh, adds fuel for um, prescribed fire, which is a great way to control re-sprouts. Um, using a lower diversity seed mix um, with a high seeding rate uh, is great when you had a heavy infestation to begin with and can be fairly confident that you had um, or that you will have a, a large flush from the soil bank as well as um, a large number of re-sprouts from those mature plants. So using a lower diversity, lower cost mix um, that will provide co competition for light and resources, but also um, fuel for prescribed burn um, in later growing seasons. Uh, here's just some, <laughs> some of those species. Um, it's kind of a mix of uh, uh, low light or sunnier species because a lot of times once you've removed the buckthorn, you're receiving a lot more uh, sunlight on that soil surface and conditions have changed a lot. Um, but you can also, especially if you had a little bit lighter of an infestation, um, go right ahead with seeding a higher diversity seed mix um, into that soil and uh, 
and giving it a, at least a growing season or two where you're mowing regularly um, while the native plants establish anyway. And just really doing some aggressive management at, at those earlier stages uh, to encourage these uh, diverse with the native to take and uh, then you can you can still do burning um, as a treatment for the re-sprouts but you're looking at maybe at like year three or so for that um, just to let these native species establish first and uh, there you're providing some really great biodiversity in your backyard and some great habitat for local wildlife um, one more option I'll mention is um, kind of taking back some of your yard so if you're if you have a woodland understory that's overtaken by buckthorn and you want to do something maybe a little bit more usable with the space there is the option of um, introducing uh, blends of fine fescues or like a low grow fescue blend so that's going to um, cover the soil help um, prevent erosion uh, and uh, competition for resources with those buckthorn seedlings but it can also be mowed much more regularly and that's really like uh, once a month or so um, as those re-sprouts come up um, and uh, fescues are known um, to be, some species are allopathic, meaning that they don't, um, well, it's like uh, releasing that little bit of toxin into the soil, so uh, they don't share uh, well, share their space well with other species, so that can be beneficial when combating buckthorn. Um, and you can just uh, stick with a plain fescue blend or even uh, introduce a bee lawn if you do have um, kind of like a part shade situation uh, in your property. Uh, let's see, I'll breeze through some options here for native um, trees and shrubs, but there are a lot of um, really wonderful native species uh, that you can introduce back into your woodland for screening type options or and for habitat value once you're fairly confident that you have the re-sprouts under control. So really not looking to add woody material for a couple of growing seasons while you're continually mowing or grazing um, your woodland understory. Um, there's a, the dogwood species, highbush cranberry, um, nannyberry, serviceberry, chokeberry, choke cherry, um, native plum, hazels, hawthorn, and then um, speckled elder can be a good alternative um, to uh, glossy buckthorn, it's similar growth habitat. Um, but you're know, providing a lot more um, high quality habitat for wildlife um, with these native species over the buckthorn. Um, and please choose native um, trees and shrubs or ornamental if you must, um, but avoid uh, invasive species, especially amber maple, honeysuckles, uh, Siberian pea shrub, barberry, and more. Um, but uh, there is the dwarf bush honeysuckle, of course, that's a native variety and great um, ground cover and can be a good competition for buckthorn as, as well. So with that, I think I um, set my time pretty well uh, up. So I can take some questions now. Great, that was so great, Bri. Um, so if you can put your questions in the chat, everybody, and Bri will take a, a few questions now from you. I haven't seen any come up so far, so you must have been doing a really <laughs> excellent. <laughs> Talking fast, covered all of my material. Well, I'll hang out too um, through the next presentation. And so if some, uh, some questions do come up, uh, feel free to ask and I can always take them at the end or feel free to email me and I think Laura you're going to put up our email addresses again at the end here. Well yes. Perfect. All right I'll quit sharing my screen here then. And then Tammy if you would like to um, unmute yourself and start your video and share your screen. Oh there we go. For you Brie. Oh. <laughs> Thanks and following cut stems with the herbicide. Oh, um, you can email me and I can give you some information on that. Okay. That's a long answer, I think, so. <laughs> yeah, yep. All right, thanks, Bree. We'll take some more questions later. In the meantime, let's welcome Tammy from the Wildlife Rehab Center of Minnesota. 
Hi everyone. Um, I was saying earlier I'm a pretty informal speaker, uh, so this is kind of a new experience um, talking through a computer and not having a direct exchange of questions and comments. Um, so bear with me on this, um, but today um, I'm going to talk about how you can help um, wildlife. Um, so injured wildlife, but then there's some other things that you can do to help wildlife too. So I'll move on through here. Um, everyone knows those are baby mallards. Um, you can tell a baby mallard from a baby wood duck by the eye stripe. So if you look on these guys, uh, you'll see the eye stripe goes from the beak all the way through their eye. Um, and a wood duck's eye stripe starts at the eye and only goes backwards. So that's a really easy way for you to tell uh, what type of ducklings you're seeing around. Uh, we did admit our first ducklings of the year already. It seems a little bit early for it, um, but we've already received our first ones. So baby ducks are out there. Uh, WRC, um, I'm assuming most of you have heard of us. Uh, we are one of the oldest wildlife hospitals in the nation. Uh, we have a, a staff of about 16 and that includes our seasonal staff. Um, most of our staff are medical based. Um, so we have quite a few DVMs on board and then we also have CBTs. So we are an actual hospital. Um, it's the same as if you were to take your pet to a veterinarian. Um, it's just that our vets work with wildlife. Uh, our goal um, of uh, wildlife rehabilitation is, of course, to get animals back out to the wild, but I think it's a bigger picture than that. Um, our goal is to stop pain and suffering. Um, uh, it's horrible to see animals suffer, and we can do that by a couple ways. We can either set up a course of treatment or we can euthanize to end the suffering if it's something that we cannot repair. Um, so in these photos here, you're seeing a Blanding's turtle on the right, uh, and you can see that it has a pretty significant shell fracture. Um, and then the two photos on the left uh, are a red fox kit, and it's the same kit, and one is taken the first day when she came in, and the other one is on the day that her eyes opened. Uh, red fox kits open their eyes around 11 to 14 days. Uh, they can be born in February, um, so they can be born fairly early. Gray fox aren't born until usually May. So I thought we would uh, start off by talking about uh, something that's happening right now out there. Um, we are seeing more window strikes now, and I imagine most of you can take a guess why, um, but it's due to migration. Uh, so your regular birds who share your yard uh, and your property with you are familiar with your house. Uh, they will still hit windows, especially if a predator like a Cooper's hawk or a cat comes through, uh, but they know where your house is, and for the most part, they're pretty savvy about your windows. How However, the migrants that are coming through right now are not. Um, so we see a large uptick in window strikes at this time of year. Um, if you watch our critter ticker, uh, which is an easy way to see what's coming into the building, uh, just go to our website, which is wrcmn.org. And if you scroll about part way down, you'll see a ticker tape uh, going across the screen with timestamps on it and species. And that is a live count of what's coming into our building. Uh, you can even pop it up into its own little window so you can keep it minimized and off to the side while you do your work. Um, but if you look at our ticker today, we received our first Virginia rail. Um, and uh, that is a um, marsh bird um, that is actually shown here in the middle photo. Um, and it had hit a window. Um, this photo here is not the actual rail that came in today, um, but this is a really good example of what a window strike bird looks like. Um, they have trouble um, balancing. Uh, they may look really sleepy. They may floof themselves up. Um, they won't be able to fly. They'll be sitting back on their hocks um, and um, they'll obviously be in need of help. Um, so what we want you to do with window strike birds is give them some time at your house unless you see an obvious injury. So if there's an open fracture where the bone is exposed, um, if there's blood present, if the bird is obviously dragging a wing and not just letting it droop, um, then we're going to want you to bring the bird in right away. Um, otherwise, pick up the bird put it in a shoe box, make sure the shoe box doesn't have any holes in it. Some of them have thumb holes, make sure it doesn't. Um, 
put them in a shoe box and put some crumpled up paper towel um, or even a kitchen towel underneath the bird first. Close the box, tape it, and put it in a dark, quiet room of your house, like an extra bedroom, an office, a bathroom, um, something where you won't be going into it. Uh, wait about two hours. Take the box outside. Don't peek inside because then you might have a bird flying around your house, which we don't want. Um, so take the box outside um, and open it up. One of three things will happen. Number one, the bird might fly away, which saves you a trip to us and is just a happy ending all around, um, which is what we hope happens. Uh, the bird may just sit there. He may look confused. He may not be flying. Um, and obviously then you have a trip to the center ahead of you. Otherwise, um, the third option is the bird may have already passed away. Um, this does happen if there's massive internal injuries. And while I know it's traumatic to find a dead bird in the box after waiting a couple hours, um, rest assured there is nothing that we could do for that bird. Um, that is just due to massive injuries and you've saved yourself a trip to the center to arrive with a deceased bird. Um, so those are your options for window strikes. Let's see here if I can find my cursor and move on. Uh, grounded birds. Uh, this is something else that we see during migration. Um, and it mainly happens uh, after a rainy night. So we get a lot of rain. Migrating birds are flying overhead. And as you probably know, lots of them migrate at night. Um, they're flying overhead and they see a large parking lot down below that is wet. What does a large wet parking lot look like from up above? It looks like a lake. So we see a lot of grounded waterfowl in the spring and fall during migration. Uh, what happens is birds like this pie-billed grebe um, and the coot that came in today uh, was grounded. Um, so grebes, coots, loons, uh, these birds all need water to take off. They cannot take off from a standing position. So these birds land and they land on the wet pavement and they're stuck. They can't go anywhere until a good Samaritan comes along and helps them. You could just take the bird and put it in the nearest body of water and hope it's okay and hope it flies away. But if you're like me, <laughs> uh, you put that bird in the water and then you realize the bird can't fly and probably not going to be able to just ignore it, um, which means you are now going into the cold water to get the bird, um, which isn't easy because I bet you could, the bird can swim. So, we would actually recommend, regardless of whether it looks like it's injured or not, bring it to us. Uh, we can do x-rays, um, we can check it out for broken bones, we can check it out for concussions, um, road rash, uh, several times they'll get abrasions. So we will do all of that. Um, so if you find a grounded bird, we would actually recommend bringing it in. So those are the two biggest things that are happening right now, and I thought I'd cover those right away. Um, but now I want to talk a little bit about things you can do to help injured wildlife by keeping healthy wildlife in the wild. Um, we are just like a human hospital. We have limited bed space, um, and we try whenever possible to keep animals in the wild because it's better for them to grow up with their parents. Uh, their parents can teach them how to survive much better than we can. Um, so one of my favorite things to ask is, what do these three species have in common? Um, and you may be wondering what a cottontail rabbit and a, a American robin and a fawn all have in common. And we're going to talk about that. They are the three most misunderstood species as far as their life cycles in the wild go. So uh, this means that they are most often brought to us when they don't need to be. So we want to really push education on these species. Um, fawns uh, will bed down and they will stay put while mom goes out and forages. And they'll do that for about the first five to six weeks of their lives. Um, of course, as they get older, they become a little more curious. They start walking around. Um, they will walk up to you and your dogs. Um, they are curious. They aren't afraid. And that is fairly normal. If you were to try to capture that fawn, it would probably run away. Um, but once they're about five, six weeks old, um, they're starting to get into trouble while mom is gone. If you find a fawn in your yard, leave it alone. Uh, try to keep the kids and dogs away. I know they're cute. I know they're fascinating animals. Watch from afar, take photos from afar. Um, mom will come back for it. She will come back once or twice 
twice a day, she may move it, she may not. Uh, the fawn may be in your yard for three or four days nonstop. All of a sudden the fawn's gone, you don't know where it went. Um, and then a week later it shows up again in your yard. And that's just because mom is moving it around. If the fawn gets flushed, like if your dog finds it before you do and it chases it across the yard and goes into the neighbor's yard, don't worry about it. Mom is going to come back when she's done foraging. And if the fawn isn't where she last saw it, she's going to snort and stomp her hoof. The fawn will also cry for its mom. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard a fawn cry. It is incredibly loud. Um, it sounds like a giant baby goat. Um, so it's a very loud bleating call. The fawn will also cry for mom if it's hungry. So even though mom's out foraging, if the fawn gets scared or if it's hungry, it's going to start to cry. It will cry for about 15 minutes. It may wander around a little bit and then it's going to curl back up and it's going to wait for her to come back. Don't worry about it. As long as it's curled up and it's calling for about 15 minutes and then laying back down, everything is fine. You will know if the fawn has become orphaned. And the way you'll know is, believe it or not, they actually throw a temper tantrum. Uh, it's the best way to describe it. Uh, this little fawn is going to be running around in your yard and it is going to be crying for an hour, maybe two hours nonstop. Um, it is truly going to look panicked. And we're not talking again, 15 minutes and bedding back down. We're talking nonstop crying. If a fawn is doing that, we want you to capture it and either bring it to us for a health check or call us. Uh, we have someone who's dedicated to just working with fawns. Um, so we will get your voicemail and we will call you back. Keep the fawn in a dark, quiet area to reduce the stress. And then when we call you back, we'll have you do a skin tent hydration test on it uh, to see if it's dehydrated. If it's dehydrated, we're going to have you bring it in. There are a couple circumstances where we would want you to bring us fawns right away. Um, the first one would be if it's obviously injured and significantly injured, not just a little scrape on its leg, um, but bleeding, limping, can't stand, is lying on its side, anything like that. Uh, for those of us who have pets, uh, it's a good sign when our pets are lying on their side, right? It means they're nice and relaxed. Fawns don't lie on their sides. They never be on their sides. If you find a fawn on its side, it's probably already starting to crash. And then we want you to just bring it to us right away. We are open daily. We're open nine to six every day. So that's about fawns. Um, I can answer more questions afterward on them. Bunnies. <laughs> Uh, I'm assuming most of you are avid gardeners um, and you probably have mixed feelings about bunnies. Um, they are a very important part of the food cycle. Uh, we ask that bunnies be left alone. Uh, we certainly don't want the bunnies brought to us just because you don't want them in your yard. Uh, we cannot take them because of that. Um, so then that puts responsibility on you to decide what you want to do with the bunnies. Um, but we cannot take them simply because people don't want them in their yards. Um, so I chose this photo of a very cute bunny because this is what they look like when they're on their own. And this is really important to understand. That bunny sitting there is a little bit smaller than a softball. They are on their own at just a little bit over three weeks of age. So they develop incredibly fast. They open their eyes at day seven. So that will give you a judgment of how old the bunnies are that you're probably finding in your gardens right now. Um, leave them be. Uh, they will grow up, uh, they'll hit the 21 day mark, they'll start to forage a little bit, they'll still go into the nest at night for a couple days, and then they will move on. Um, mom usually kicks them out of her territory. Um, you can move a bunny nest if you have to, but you can only move it two or three feet at a time. You have to replicate the nest, you have to move it intact, you have to leave it for two days to make sure mom is coming back. If she isn't coming back, then you're gonna to have to put it back where it was. Um, and we can give you more instructions on how to do that um, over a phone call. There's quite a few steps involved, but because it's only a short period of time, we usually ask you to just leave bunnies be. Uh, we have cut our bunny admits nearly in half, and we are also doing a reunite program, which means if you bring us baby bunnies, we're going to look at them. And if they are healthy and being cared for by mom, we say, congratulations, these bunnies are perfectly healthy, please put them back in the nest. Um, you can imagine there's a slight pause as the people realize that we are sending them back home with the bunnies, um, but this is to keep them in the wild, to leave space in the hospital for injured wildlife. 
we have a Facebook post up with a photo um, of my two dogs. Um, there is a bunny nest under that laundry basket. Uh, it is a super easy way if you have dogs um, to be outside. You can be outside all day long. You can have a bonfire that night. Anytime you and your dogs are out in the yard, cover the nest with a laundry basket. Put a couple tent stakes through it so the dogs won't push it off. Um, if you're anything like my dogs, they're going to sit there and stare at the bunny nest for about 15 minutes and then they're going to give up and they'll start playing with you and walking around the yard again. Um, this is a perfect easy way to protect that nest. You have to keep the nest uncovered overnight so mom can come and nurse in the evening and in the morning and then um, anytime your dogs aren't in the yard we want it uncovered so she can come back uh, again there's a longer Facebook post on this on our Facebook page fledglings uh, this is the third animal that I was talking about um, we see so many healthy fledglings and people just don't understand that this is a very important learning curve in a young bird's life um, there are some species that leave the nest before they can fly um, there are other species that don't and we'll talk about that in a second but for the ones that do um, they generally bail out and they live on the ground for almost a week it can be five to seven days while their flight and tail feathers grow in so if you look at this picture of the very cute cedar waxwing you can see his flight feathers are just starting to grow in as are his adorable little tail feathers um, cedar waxwings kind of branch out almost like owls do um, and sometimes they end up on the ground so they just need to be put back up in the shrub that they were sitting under um, robins, um, cardinals, even blue jays will sometimes spend time on the ground before they fly. Leave them be. Um, they're going to be hopping all over the place. They're going to try to cross the street. They're going to go into your neighbor's yard. We know that people have cats that they leave, that they leave out. We know there's feral cats around. Um, we can't control that. That is something that humans can control themselves. They need to take care of the cats um, being out, but we cannot control them predating on the birds. Um, so the birds need to be left where they are um, to learn this life cycle. The parents are around, they'll be issuing alarm calls to the birds. This is how they learn to evade predators. Um, they're going to learn to seek out shade from the sun um, and from the rain. Um, they're going to learn how to find food. And within three or four days, they'll be taking little short um, flights of maybe four or five feet. Um, by day seven, they should be flying really well. Of course, if something happens to one of these fledglings, bring it into us, right? If a cat gets it, if your dog gets it, um, if a crow finds it, if some other predator finds it, if it's obviously injured, bring it into us. If it's healthy, leave it be. We are really, really good at troubleshooting and we can help you out with different situations over the phone too. So always feel free to call us about these guys. These are some birds that should not be on the ground. You should never find a baby cavity nester on the ground. If you do, something has caused it to prematurely fledge. Um, and so that could be a red squirrel getting into the nest. It could be a snake. It could be a, a wren getting into a nuthatch nest. Um, it could be a downy woodpecker going in and deciding that they want it. All sorts of things can cause birds to prematurely fledge. Um, so if you find a cavity nester on the ground and you cannot get back into the nest and the parents are not coming to care for it once it is back into the nest, then you should bring it into us right away. And uh, these little guys, it's actually a video. Uh, so I thought you'd like to see what baby wrens look like. So cute. So these are baby house wrens. Uh, the top right photo are baby hummingbirds. Um, they are also birds that should not be on the ground even though they're not a cavity nester. And then the lower right is a um, young juvenile um, uh, white-breasted nuthatch. So again, cavity nesters and hummingbirds should not be on the ground. You find them, bring them into us if you can't get them back into the nest box. Turtles! <laughs> uh, we've already had a couple of our um, uh, first of the year turtles arrive. Uh, they are out and about, um, but the mass migration hasn't started yet. Um, so we see turtles, uh, turtle spikes three times a year. Um, we see two back to back in the spring. One is um, turtles may leave their winter ponds for their breeding ponds. Um, they will cross roads to do that. 
the second spike that follows immediately after that um, are female turtles going to their nest sites. And they return to the same nest site year after year. Um, they know where they're going um, and they will do anything to get there, which is why it's also important to not relocate turtles. So we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, the third spike we see is in the fall um, and that can either be baby turtles, snapping turtles that have emerged and are going to their ponds or again turtles going back to their winter ponds. Um, so I find it personally amazing um, how our vets can put turtle shells back together. Um, it's absolutely stunning to me. A turtle can come in and I think to myself that turtle's never going to make it and then sure enough they've done like a complete jaw restructuring on it or they've put the turtle shell totally back together again. Um, so if you do find an injured turtle bring it to us. It is critical that you note the location found. Um, as I said, turtles have this amazing GPS in their head and they know where they're going. So if you take a turtle and you decide it's not in a safe location and you decide to move it to a safer pond, if it's a female turtle or if it has a wintering pond, that turtle is just now gonna have to walk even farther to get to where it wants to go which means it's crossing more roads. So you're actually putting the turtle at an increased risk. So location found, note it down. I don't care if it's like across from the Methodist Church in Minnetonka or um, two miles north of County C on the right side of the road. Make some note about where it is um, that you can give to us. So when it comes time to release the turtle, we get it as close as possible back to where it came from. This is a snapping turtle and it has, I think this is the one that has a feeding tube in it. Um, uh, so you can see it has a pretty significant nose damage to it. Um, and this is one of those other, one of those situations where I was talking about, it's amazing to me that our vets can actually reconstruct fractured jaws. So this is actually how we construct and um, keep turtle shells uh, together uh, while they're healing. So turtle shells are like bone, they'll knit, um, but the edges do have to be fresh. So this is a Blanding's turtle and you can see on the left uh, that it has some significant fractures um, and because it is living tissue, it does bleed. And then on the right, you can see it's the same turtle, but now she's all patched up. So you can see it's almost like putting a puzzle back together. You just have to keep moving the shell pieces around until they all come together. And then once you get them in the right spot, the tension will help hold the shells in place. And then we put in a little bit to stabilize it while it's healing. So you can see there's some wire up in the very front of the shell um, and that will be removed once the shell knits. And then those putty pieces down the left side are because that big left piece um, was broken um, and needed some stability down into the bridge area. Um, so that is just providing some extra stability while that big piece heals. All hardware is removed from our patients before we release them. It can take a good six, eight, maybe 12 weeks for total shells to heal. It all depends on how severe it is. Uh, turtles um, are amazing animals. Um, like I said, they have this great GPS in their head. Um, and this is one of my favorite stories of a rehab turtle. Um, a few years ago, uh, let's see, two years ago, I got an email from someone down at the Minnesota Valley U.S. Fish and Wildlife Office. And one of their rangers had been out patrolling and had found this turtle crossing the road uh, and noticed the damage to the shell. So you can see it has um, a pretty good scar where it healed and then it's actually missing a chunk in the front of the shell. It's missing that chunk because that gap um, when it came in that chunk was missing and there was nothing to knit those two ends together. So as long as it's a fairly small gap like that the turtle will be just fine. It forms a scar tissue there. So anyway they took the photo and they emailed it to us and they said by any chance can we you know look up the turtle do we know uh how when it came in did we rehab it was it released and we have an incredible medical database um i can't tell you all the details in it um but i searched our medical database and found out that this turtle had indeed come into us um it had uh, been treated for its fractured shell and released exactly where they found it three years prior so this turtle for three years is still continuing the same crossing on the same road every single spring. 
Um, so it's a really neat story for us that this turtle is doing really well, um, but it also just underlines the fact that it's so important to keep these guys back in their territories. Uh, you may also know this, but uh, in recent years, the DNR has now prohibited all turtle possession. So it used to be um, that you could go and take a Western painted turtle from the wild and keep it as a pet. Um, no more. The DNR has said no herp tiles, actually. Um, so that means no more frogs, no more lizards, um, no salamanders, um, no turtles. All of these species are um, at risk due to a, a fungal um, uh, a fungus that's coming into the state and so the DNR has said you know no more possession of these guys so if you have uh, these guys in your possession you should call the Minnesota Herp Society and they will help you place them that is all I had I hope I um, didn't go over my time too much um, but we have a very very active social media um, so if you want to follow along with us feel free I will let you know that when you call us at this time of year you are going to get our voicemail we do not answer the phone when we have someone in the lobby uh, we focus on the patients in the lobby first we do however have a contingent of volunteers off-site and all they do are answer voicemails so um, don't keep calling back. Uh, you still aren't going to get through. Uh, the most expedient way for us to call you is to leave a message and make sure that the phone number that you're leaving for us has a voicemail that is set up. Um, it is so frustrating for us if we call and there is no voicemail, uh, we will make two or three attempts and then we're not going to make any more attempts. Um, so make sure when you call us, uh, leave a very detailed message with a working voicemail. Thanks for having me today. <laughs> yes, thank you so much, Tammy. I have, as I mentioned to you earlier, made a lot of visits to the Wildlife Rehab Center, one of my favorite rescue organizations. And I just want to encourage folks, if you do bring an injured or or orphaned animal in, to uh, be sure to leave a donation because, you know, these organizations don't run on nothing. So um, thanks for your good work. I, oh, thank you so much. <laughs> yes. I have a quick question for you to start, and then um, we're going to take Q&A, and uh, Brandon's going to watch for additional questions in the chat. Um, so Tammy, starting with you, can you give some advice on how to pick up some of the larger turtles, like the snapping turtles? I know that some people grab them by the tails, and I don't think that's the right way. Uh, you are correct. Um, their tail is an extension of their spine um, and it can cause nerve damage, um, especially with the really weighty guys. Um, so yes, please don't pick them up by the tail. Um, if it's a snapping turtle, um, it doesn't look like they have very long necks because they keep themselves all pulled into their shells, but believe it or not, their neck can um, dart out and turn around and get to the midpoint on their shell. So you never want to pick up a snapping turtle on its sides. Uh, what you want to do, and I know this is kind of hard to envision, but you want to take uh, one hand and slide it underneath the turtle um, at the back, like underneath its left rear leg going forward until it's fairly well balanced on that hand and you feel like you can pick it up. When you have your left hand under it in a good spot, you want to take your right hand and stabilize it by hanging onto the shell above its right rear leg. And this will allow you to slide it into a box if it needs to come to us. If you're helping it across the road, um, you can just simply pick it up and carry it across the road. And yes, it is true, the turtle will probably pee um, and you have the back of it facing you, so just be aware of that. Um, but that is the way to pick up a snapping turtle. All the other turtles, you can just pick up midpoint on the shell and carry them across the road. Thank you for joining us for today's Earth Chapter. Thanks to Pollinator Friendly Alliance, our host, and Ramsey County Soil and Water, our co-host. If you have questions or inquiries, please contact pollinatorfriendly.org.